Hi, I'm Jeremy Sinemaki, the Veterans Employment and Training Services Director for Veterans Florida. And we're here at the Veterans Florida 2021 Virtual Expo sponsored by Bank of America. We're gonna talk about SkillBridge and give a, a brief overview. Uh, Eric, can you please introduce yourself and uh, give your experience with SkillBridge? Yeah, uh, thanks for having us on, Jeremy. I really appreciate it. Uh, so real quick, Navy, old Gulf War Navy vet guy, rough transition, started a company after many years at DOD and at university and private sector, started a company to help military veterans achieve meaningful, lucrative post-service careers. Um, we really poured a lot of gas on that fire when we partnered with Horace uh, and his team at uh, OUSD in the SkillBridge program. So now every single pipeline we build from the Pentagon in their digital pipeline what is what I'm talking about. Pentagon to workforce, HR, cybersecurity, general management, code enforcement for my standards and evals guys and gals. I mean, we cover down on about 30 to 40% of the E6 and above transition and out of, of service every year uh, through our DOD uh, SkillBridge, uh, DOD approved SkillBridge program. So. Uh, that's our experience as well on the other side of the house, placing them with employers to get the OJT, train them at night to get the certifications in those professions. So when they present to the civilian workforce 90 days, 120 days later, they got OJT and it's validated with credentials, makes hiring a slam dunk. So that's our experience. Yeah, thanks for being here, Doc. Yep. All right, Bor we're lucky enough to have Boris here from the Department of Defense. Boris, uh, would you please introduce yourself and... and let us know about the SkillBridge program. Sure. Thanks so much, Jeremy, and uh, thanks, Doc, for the intro as well. Uh, my name is Boris Kuhn. I'm a Navy veteran myself, uh, separated in 2018. Uh, a little bit, ex I expired earlier than necessary, but that's okay. Some of us do that. And my, my wife is actually still out there doing great things with the Army. Uh, to the point that was made, I, I oversee the credentialing and workforce programs to include SkillBridge within the Department of Defense at the Office of Secretary of Defense. So I don't, I'm very inclusive in that sense. So it's not Army, Navy, or Marine Corps, or Air Force. I take care of everybody, including our guardians, our newest uh, brothers and sisters from that standpoint. So SkillBridge overarchingly is a program for any service member who has served at least 180 days and has up to 180 days uh, available to participate in employment training. Employment training can be anything from pre-apprenticeships to apprenticeships to certification training, which are certificate programs basically, and then to include a certification or licensure towards that with the experiential piece as uh, Doc alluded to. Um, the main point of that effect is with regard to employment training is to make sure that our service members are no longer walking out the door after serving our nation honorably to be able to be successful post-service and return back to communities on par with their peers or better for, you know, as a thank you. We had a lot of trouble, as we all know, and we've seen in past generations of our brothers and sisters who have served in the past. And so we're trying to make a difference from that standpoint. Uh, we learned a lot from that standpoint that uh, it's too late to try to catch up with a veteran. Uh, after pre DD 214. So we try to do the best we can today uh, as we see the transition space um, going to the left of the D214. That, it, that includes basically starting to educate, when I say educate, build that knowledge base for our service members the minute they you know earn their sailor, marine, soldier hat at a basic training. So that might seem odd to a lot of people, but the reality is people serve different time frames from two years to 30 years. And we never know when that time is gonna come for our service members. Um, there's a wide variety here on this particular um, conference call here. So that's a great example of why that's important to educate our force, to make sure they're aware of all their benefits. And, and it's not after the fact, and it's, by then it's too late. So thank you for having you here, Jeremy, look forward to it. Yeah, thank you, Boris, for for being here today. We, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, we're also lucky to have somebody who just very, very recently completed the SkillBridge program. Charlene, would you please introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your experience with SkillBridge? Sure, thanks, Jeremy. Um, so yeah, as Jeremy mentioned, I'm a newly retired Lieutenant Colonel from the Army. 
I just finished the skill bridge on 1 May uh, 2021. I did six months prior to retiring with the University of Florida's agriculture program. That's it. All right, thanks for being here, Charlene. Mm -hmm. we appreciate having you. And then also we have another uh, alumni, I guess, of the SkillBridge program. Uh, you might have seen among some other panels, Derek Fishback. Uh, would you please introduce yourself and uh, tell us your experience with SkillBridge? Sure, thanks, Jeremy. Um, my name is Derek Fishback. I am a graduate of the SkillBridge program from 2019. I'm a former U.S. Army Colonel. Um, and uh, I, along the way, I learned to maximize the skill bridge program because I realized that old colonels are probably the hardest to hire anywhere uh, out there these days. And so I heard about the skill bridge program in 2018, applied in 2019, and then went through the program in 2019. So I'm currently a resident in Pensacola, Florida. And also from that program, I'm currently um, employed with uh, Amazon Web Services. Thanks, Jeremy. Great. Great. Well, thank you for being here, Derek. We appreciate having you. All right. Um, we're going to get into some questions about SkillBridge. Uh, these first, this first question I'm, I'm going to ask of, of you, Charlene. Um, how did you learn about the DOD SkillBridge program while you were in the Army and starting your transition process? Um, for me, I had a, a peer who just recently retired and had gone through the SkillBridge program. Their skill bridge was only like a two months long though. So um, I didn't really understand it. I just knew that they weren't in the office anymore. And um, so when I went through the transition assistance program, the TAPS classes, they brought it up again and said that it's, it could be as, um, as long as six months. And so I was like, oh, okay, that, well, that's significant. That could really, you could really learn something in six months. Um, so I um, did all the paperwork. Um, the biggest challenge for me was that on McDill, they didn't have an army rep. So I had to do all my paperwork and everything in Georgia. And even in the Georgia office, unless you got to the right specific person, nobody really knew what you were talking about. So it was, you know, about a week challenge. And then, you know, some direct emails made things flowing again. So <laughs> it all worked out. <laughs> Right, and this was pretty uh, recent within the last two years, right? Yeah, I started in November of last year. Yeah, right. so maybe they, you know, got some new personnel or maybe um, things have been more educated, but uh, at the time people kind of were, didn't really know what to do with me. So. <laughs> well, you had kind of a unique experience because you were also attached to an Air Force base as All an right. Army soldier, correct? That's correct. That is so that, correct. I'm sure brought a unique set of challenges that not every person seeking skill bridge would face. That's would true. Say, say yep. that's and, true. And it was also the first year I believe the University of Florida was doing the skill bridge for people who hadn't yet left the service. So there was a lot of firsts when I went through. So. Right. So Derek, would you like to add to that? How did you find out about the SkillBridge program and, and what did you do to, to get into it? So I guess me and Charlene are like twins at this point because I kind of went through the same thing. Um, I found out about the SkillBridge program by just querying it first in the Army. And then I went to a Hiring Our Heroes job seminar and I heard about fellowships and apprenticeships there. And I started to uh, do my own investigation and met with the people, talk with them and got aligned. And just like Charlene, I discovered there were no support systems in place for the army personnel stationed at another services base. Um, I was stationed here at Pensacola Naval Air Station. I was the only army colonel in the entire area. And so I had to uh, do my investigation. I, I found out that they had an office in Atlanta, Georgia, and I wrote to that office for my skill bridge program, um, particularly with, through hiring our heroes and applied through that and got army approval over several months to, to attend it and wound up doing my fellowship actually in Atlanta, Georgia at IBM Corporation. So I wound up doing that. But again, like with Charlene faced, it was the same thing. Some people knew about it, some people didn't know about it. Um, it was nowhere near the proliferation that it is now, so. Great, great. So uh, I'm gonna move over to you, Doc. Um, how, did, how would somebody 
who's interested in hosting a skill bridge person um, start the application process to do that so that they can get one of these quality service members like Derek or Charlene? So for us on the, the pool side, right, trying to, trying to attract both the talent and find places to put them, um, the website is really helpful um, as a generic kind of magnet. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if the website was up and broadcast at that point deeply uh, when Charlene and Derek were using it. But for us, we get about 60 inquiries a month uh, coming in on the vet side. And we have programmatic guides on our website. We, we, we actually built a special page on the website just for folks coming off the DOD site. Um, we've got all our programmatic guides there with all the criteria. Here's the steps one through 19 you need to push you know, when you find a counselor, maybe they know what you're talking about. Maybe they don't have them push these 19 buttons. You know what I mean? It spits out the right stuff. For employers, what we're finding is because of what we were already doing in the space, right? Placing veterans into, you know, HR, project management, IT, cyber, whatever. Those employers at first, and I, I'm sure Boris gets this all the time. At first they were like, nah, we don't do, uh, we only do interns in the summer. And I'm like, well, these aren't college kids. These people have 50, 20, 25 years of experience. They're professionals. I mean, they're, you know. Um, so, so actually on the paperwork internally, they're uh, interns. But when we talk externally, they're residents. Because we're going to put them on your job site. You're going to give them their residency on the job training, OJT. We're going to mentor them. We do daily meetings with all of our interns. We mentor them and we train them in the credentials that validate the experience you're training them on host site. So for us, word of mouth has been a really big deal because a company that we already knew or had a relationship will say, oh yeah, we'd love to have one of those and take them for a test drive. And a really cool unintended benefit was they get the first Charlene or the first Derek and they go in there and just, you know, walk off homers inning after inning. And they're like, before the first residence done, 90 days, 120 days, they call us back and say, yeah, so we got a problem with that contract. Like we're going to need three or four more because we want to do them every two and a half months instead of once a year. Cause that's how they always start. Yeah, we'll do once a year. By the time the first one's done, these companies are like, Hey, we need four or five a year so we can get overlap and maintain continuity. I mean, the companies that are, that are using this program are absolutely loving it. So word of mouth for us is somebody will retire, go into this company, suggest, you know, get an intern from us. So for us, again, we modified that page on our website. So now you can send employers to this piece of the website or veterans to this piece of the website. So we're trying to reduce, again, the barriers that Charlene and Derek were talking about is, you know, just trying to make it the easy button. Hey, TLDR, read this paragraph, bottom line up front, watch this how-to video, push these 19 buttons, you're fine. Here's your piece of paper. Yeah, you bring up bring up a good point about, um, you know, the once the first ones get through, we've seen an increase in demand from in, the same employers wanting to send through more people on SkillBridge. And then that turns to how do we get how do we get these people uh, to participate? But uh, I want to kind of change the topic a little bit since we're we're fortunate to have Boris on. Boris, uh, can you talk uh, to real quick about the types of people. So when you get an application, what types of skill bridges are you willing to approve? What uh, levels of experience are you willing to approve? Uh, when you get that application, what, what are the criteria for participating in this program? So Jeremy, when you're, let me make sure I qualify your statement. Are you saying from the service member or from industry? Well, so if, if from both. So okay. if I'm an employer and I have a, a need for, say, a welder or a doctor, what what levels of experience do I need to get my program in SkillBridge? And then from a service member perspective, if I'm an E3, can I go participate in some entry level skill bridges, or do I have to be an E7 and you know have 15, 20 years experience? Sure. So. Um, each, each service, and then why I want to start off with you know, each service has we, we have the overarching policy at, at the Department of Defense, 
and then each service can, you know, obviously fine tune it X, Y, Z. So number one, um, there, there's, there's a desire to make sure our service members are not, we're not creating a, I'll call it an apprenticeship, uh, you know, farm, if you will. And then there's no career at the end. That's number one. Or apprenticeship farm. And then there's no nothing at the end of the day. So, so we don't need seasonal. We're not trying to create seasonal workers for any in particular industry or anything like that. We, we, when we went to evaluate the program in 2018, so uh, luckily Daryl and Charlene didn't have participate in that. So a lot of senior individuals were actually kind of experiencing that. And, um, and it's, it's shameful to your point. Nothing. So we went and, and I would say stop those kinds of practices. So we look for quality assurance factors like that. The other factors is we want to make sure that we protect the service members from not going into careers or not paying them their worth, if that makes sense. Now, paying their worth is a qualitative statement, correct? Because an individual could have been a colonel and they're making a lot of money per se based on the the locality and other factors. Um, their MOS could have a bonus structure, all those kinds of things. What I mean by that is, what are what is the individual wanting to make post service, but also what does that career look like in that space? So, like Doc might say, project management, right? So, project management nationwide has a national average, and we want to make sure that national average is resident across across the state line. So, in particular, in Florida, for instance, you know. An individual who, I, I use this all the time because I see Pensacola is near and dear to my heart uh, for being prior Navy, but also even the Air Force installations. And we have a project manager in DC is not gonna make the same as a project manager in Florida. We know that for a fact. So a cur- and so since we have a colonel, a colonel and an E4 are not gonna make the same in Florida. But they're going to make livable wages. You just have to make sure that that's the right amount. Sorry, I didn't mean call as it's come as a reporting here. Um, so that that's what's important to us from an industry perspective. So I just want to make sure that that's there. We we were having issues that were coming before before we provide a centralized. Uh, quality assurance process for all industry. I just want to make that clear. So to your point, when when we did what we did, and you guys are in case, it's great having one central place. We had a, a little bit of subjectivity and bias going into it. Like, well, we need, we had subjective constraints, like 50,000 hours. It has to be minimum 50,000 hours. Well, in particular careers, that you know, Florida is not paying 50,000 hours for that for, for your field. They're paying 30, but 30,000 in Florida for that particular career is excellent compared to 30,000 in, in DC. And I'm going to use that because here I am in DC and in your Florida, but same thing in Idaho. We can we can take any other location. So that's that's most important for us from an industry perspective. So if you're an industry partner, just make sure. And I'm sure if Veterans of Florida is, uh, I'll say, endorsing your or make, getting, giving us the phone call to us for a service, I'm sure you you already have a check mark by your name. From a service member standpoint, we did have those biases in place too. So from a standpoint of the diversity, equity, and inclusion, we've always been equitable and we made sure we eliminated those biases. So a lot of uh, issues came into play. So depending on the service, in some services, they stated that this program is only for, to your point, E4s and below. In other services, they said it was only for retirees. So in that case, their terms, you know, Charlene's of the world were, going to, were plussed up. That was not the point of Skillbridge. Skillbridge, of the spirit of the law, was to help any service member that was going to be impacted from an employment standpoint. The true intent was for the combat arms, right? So when we look at, at the, the OIF, OEF, plus up of forces, and when we say combat arms, people start thinking Army Marine Corps. But we had a lot of blue become green to support that. Uh, we had a lot of those individuals, especially in the junior ranks. So you had individuals who were trained in X, but they were getting sent out to Iraq and Afghanistan. And all they knew was the same thing as an infantry person. And then they're getting processed out. So no equitable skill sets, right? So that's the key point there um, is the fact that it's not just about skills, it's how do I help 
make sure Charlene, who's always who's been in the army for 20, 30 years, can also be able to translate her skill sets to the private sector. So in, we have we have the luxury here to have two army individuals, and on the other side we have two navy individuals. But we both talk different cultures, correct? But we also but we talk DOD. So the business acclimate is important. So we don't have profit margins, we have budgets, for instance, in project management, but we also always have a 6% delta to make sure because we don't know what's gonna happen in that year. We know there's, there's gonna be a conflict somewhere, right? There's gonna be a hurricane that's gonna come through somewhere or something's gonna happen that we're gonna need access funding for. And those are critical elements. So to your point, it's available to the E1 to the, o, I'll say 06, right? For the most part, a general is going to be able to get by. But when I say 06, because we want that 06 to buy, bite and buy in to support that E1. And, the, you know, the fact is we, we have to make sure we support everybody. At the end of the day, if you're an individual who's going to seek post-employment and you desire to use Skillbridge, it's there for you. But the with them, right, what's in it for me applies to everybody equally. So you're in a leadership role. Make sure you're supporting those who are not in a leadership role, right? They're dependent on you as a leader to make that available to them as well, especially because they're the most disparate group at the end of the day. And I would love to have Derek and Charlene you know, um, provide their accounts because they were, I would say, affected both as 06s and 05s, if I'm not mistaken, how that impact is. Right. So, um, you know, Derek, on some of the other panels, you spoke extensively to that. Um, I think on our webinar that we did a few months ago, you spoke to that as well. Um, would you like to add to that from a, a leadership perspective and, and supporting, you know, the, the E1 all the way to the, the O10? Um, in yeah. Yeah, yes, I think it's important for senior leaders at our, all services at every level to understand the program and the benefits of the program. This is the, reason, the main reason why is because um, all of them have to eventually transition out of the military at some point in their career, and they will need transition assistance of some sort because of their leadership, um, positions that they've held or the rank that they hold. Um, but I think it's key because it's not just for X population, it's actually for the military as a whole. And you have to treat it that way and treat it with the same countenance and respect you do any other education program for service members. And why is that? because each one of your service members um, will transition out of the military at some point, whether they retire, whether they leave the service and the market is set to receive them, but not all the skills that they possess. And so you kind of, if you don't support them and they're trying to get in the program, you set them at a distinct disadvantage as a now, as soon to be veteran to not be competitive in a market that we've trained them to have skill sets for. Um, I can fully understand the combat arms piece because I saw it firsthand at Fort Hood, what they were going through uh, for a lot of transition for soldiers in the combat arms. And they had a hard time getting people employed once they finished. Um, it's easier for someone with a technical background to get, to get a transition to another position. But even now in today's post-COVID or actually continually COVID environment we're in, you've got to be competitive at a distance. So how do you do that if you can't show on paper where you have some of the skill sets necessary to proceed. So it's kind of important for senior leaders offer to understand the benefits of the program for service member, um, the, the future implementation for them as the program comes along, and also long-term what it really means for the society as a whole. Keeping veterans, keeping soldiers, keeping sailors and airmen um, employed post their service time actually directly impacts the, the economy, actually directly impacts society. And so if we create this massive population of unemployed people, they're not rushing back to the military. I can't go back. Charlene can't go back because we're officially retired. They're not going to hire me back. It's not going to be the same methodology. So what does that mean? The other aspect is as a senior leader or as a senior member of the military, um, the higher you go, the, actually the toughest part is to re-employ you, which I discovered the hard way. Um, as I was going through my skill bridge uh, fellowship and they're proposing me to, to employers, they were pretty much discovering that either I was so senior and experienced that I equated to what their managers or senior directors, or even as I was told, when I had more experience than their CEOs had in terms of both managing budget and personnel levels. 
And I was kind of surprised by that. But you think they wouldn't want to teach and mentor somebody like that. They can know they see it as a competition. And so that kind of transition mentally and professionally into the civilian world does require a, a period of time to do that. And SkillBridge offers that period of time to, to transition professionally, personally, to adjust to working in a civilian career environment. Um, it helps senior leaders also because it is also a great, no kidding, retention tool. Um, because every soldier is not going to, every every service member is not going to stay in their service. It's just it's just math after a while. But imagine that you you're trying to recruit people and you tell them that hey, when you possibly leave the service, you know the military has a way, or the Department of Defense has a way of helping train, make sure that you're aligned to a skill set that you can utilize after you leave the military and educate them. I spent a lot of time coaching, counseling, and mentoring. Um, transitioning service members on, on the bigger picture. Most believe that when they leave the service, that somebody's just going to absorb them. And the harsh reality is it is a process. And you have to understand how to be in that process. And I tell them the skill bridge is your number one avenue because it shows to them that you have the drive and the initiative to learn in a different industry, but you also now have the experience working outside of something you've been doing for 20, 15, 12 years something totally different than what you were doing before. And that's important. So that's about the best way I can sum it up, Jeremy. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, that as you know, there are some people like Charlene and, and that's one of the reasons we, we have her on today is uh, she decided she didn't want to pursue what she did in the military. She wanted to go into an industry that was completely different. So, um, you know, I think it's great that SkillBridge, you know, accommodates those people in all those different roles. Um, rather, you're 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 a combat armed person, and you're just trying to find your way in a civilian career that has nothing to do with what you did in the, in the military, because there is no equivalent. Or somebody that just wants to start something new, or somebody like like you, Derek, that wants to, uh, you know, continue down the the, the path that they may have had in the military, but doesn't have the credentials or the certifications or the things that, you know, Doc Wright helps them get while they're going through SkillBridge in his program if that's 2 p.m. So, um, all right, I, I'm going to go uh, to the next question. Charlene, uh, can you kind of tell us a little bit about some of the biggest challenges you faced with the SkillBridge program? Uh, sure. Um, the first challenge was just finding out about it. So uh, like I mentioned before, I did have a peer that um, was involved in it. Then there was a tap class. And they basically discussed it on a slide of a million things and said it for about five seconds. And then I was like, hey, that seems like a good idea. How can I find out more? Oh, contact this guy who was the Air Force point of contact who said, I'm not your guy. So then, of course, that's when Google came in handy and I was like, hey, who do I need to talk to? Which led me to the DOD website and the multitude map of all the skill bridges across the country that I could uh, get involved in. Um, I got down to Florida and, you know, those, no offense, uh, Boris, but those little dots on that map are a pain in the butt. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to like get your little pointer right on that dot to get the information. <laughs> and then the- um, We want more, Shari. <laughs> we, we don't have a duck dot. They're, they're like, we want more states, well, more dots. Yeah, so there's a lot of dots and, you know, if you don't pick the right one, you're just clicking on the same dot over and over again. Um, so, so we get, when I we'll that response back, we, we, we tried regional, by the way, so I want you to know, and uh, we had negative responses on that one, too, because we, uh, we, so we tried to like make the map bigger, right, regional, yeah. like southeast, so that way you have a bigger span, it, it doesn't seem so, uh, so that, that's a good good feedback, I appreciate that. Yeah, so like I'm in Tampa, I, I was at McDill, and uh, so I'm looking for a skill bridge around McDill, and there are none. And I'm like, how is this possible? There's, everybody's retiring out of McDill. So I started looking up north in the Gainesville area. And that's when I found the University of Florida Agriculture Program. And I said, I guess I'll just have to commute. And when I got on the phone with them, they were like, oh, no, we have, you know, departments all over Florida. 
And I was like, really? So it's not reflective of the actual locations of where the skill bridges are being held. It's just the headquarters, really. So I, I think that that's maybe a point we could improve on. Um, the other last thing, and that's just, that's just you know, user friendliness of it. But one of the things, because I'm, I'm an 05 or was an 05, uh, is that Gilbridge is not part of the nomenclature, language, vocabulary that we've learned at any point in my 20 years have I ever heard of Skillbridge until I took that TAP class. So I, I don't know how to incorporate that and in possibly, you know, training um, people to mentor um, transitioning soldiers or how we can get this into a lexicon of leaders. But when I presented this to my 06 GS50, they were like, what is this? And are you sure this is for you? And, you know, there were all these questions to me, like to prove that this is an actual thing. <laughs> so, I mean, I, 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 I believe that eventually, because I was able to prove it through the TAP class, I was able to educate my leaders, but that should have happened before I got there is my point. And um, I just don't know how maybe through our normal military training, we can start incorporating these kinds of things, but it's just, it's, it's a challenge because nobody's really taught about retirement till you want to retire. Nobody's taught about transitioning until you transition. So, um, yeah. Can I comment on that? Would that be something that well, sooner? So I know there's a number of things going on um, in the military and with different organizations trying to uh, bring awareness to SkillBridge. Boris, is there anything you can talk to about uh, within the Department of Defense, uh, any types of initiatives to make sure it's more prevalent in TAPS or anything like that? No, absolutely yeah. Well, not no, but yes, as, as they're probably, probably saying it. So no, number one, if, if you actually look up a DOTI, try to look up a DOTI for, you know, when we see DOTI, Department of Defense Issuance Instruction, uh, you won't find Skillbird, right? Because when, when the instruction came out for the program, we quite didn't know what to call it. So if you actually look it up, it's like JSAT IT or AT, or, so it's inclusive of everything that happens inside of Skillbridge. And um, Skill Bridge came about about roughly two, three years later. So the term Skill Bridge, what we call the trade market now, came about in 2015. So the reality is the authorities and the program is so new, and we really didn't take off from an OSD perspective and from the services. Um, I would say, Charlene and Eric, you, you, you both are very lucky from the standpoint of where you are able to have the information and that's why it was so important for us when I, I guess when I came over is to revamp the program from where we were at in 2018. It's like, so effectively, you can say Skill Bridge was birthed in 2013, but it started crawling in 20, mid 2019. So June 2019, we launched the site, we started doing the marketing, and that's where, you know, Doc and you know, even veterans for it, people started learning exactly what it was so from that standpoint it's going to take time you know we are a large bureaucracy but it's it's happening very rapidly to see the growth of the program and where it's at today that all services are now on board with the program is is pretty impressive for us because i'll use any other program other than the other ones were forced for us to have so it came with money um but a tuition assistance. Tuition assistance was authorized, and that's just paying for courses. Most people don't realize that. And it was gained for um, an enlisted to entice them to come into uh, service, right? Education benefits while you serve. Um, and that didn't take off for almost 20 plus years. It started taking off in the mid 80s, uh, but it was authorized in the 60s, uh, if you will. So from where we're at today, um, I'm pretty proud of the skill program itself. It's not about, well, you came in around that. No, I'm actually pretty proud of the fact that it started in 2013 and where we're at today, the participation level. And to Charlene's point, absolutely, I agree with you 100%. Um, the biggest uh, buy-in we need to have is from leadership and from the retraining because 
one of the biggest problems we have in the Department of Defense is we don't have this, we don't have a culture of continuous learning, right? Like you do this training 20 years ago and like you're done, peace out. And uh, for instance, for, for leaders like yourselves, there is no, you don't have an executive training where you can go into and learn about existing programs, how to support your command. Uh, they have somewhat programs here and there, but it's really learning from your fellow brothers and sisters, right? Who've gone through it through, like you said, you learn from somebody else. Or Derek, you were in Pensacola for you were the only <laughs> army person, the closest one to you was probably Fort Bragg or Fort um, right and right. then through Atlanta. So because at the time, I guarantee you, Navy was not participating. Like Navy was hiding the program. And especially uh, organization, um, installations like Pensacola, which is initial training, they don't want to let soldiers know about, I mean, sailors know about a program that's about, quote, employment training post-service or post-service careers. It's just the mindset of the cultures. That, that's the main thing is, to Derek's point earlier, I absolutely love what you said. It's it's about recruitment and, and readiness because if we talk about the fact that we will take care of you on the back end, no matter what, the front end is, is about quality uh, assessments, right? So making sure we get the next Jeremy, the next Derek's, the next Doc's, and anybody else who wants to come through the door, we got to tell them what, we're, what we got for you. And if we're always hiding, because to me, I'll be honest with you, I came into the military with a, D, with a GED. Uh, good enough something, I don't know, diploma, I guess. And, and here I am, I think I'm a success story on, on its own, but how can we tell everybody you can do exactly that if you want to, right? Or whatever you want to do. And in Sharon's case, she did whatever you did and for however long you did, Sharon, right? 20 plus years you served in the army and you wanted to do completely different. And to your points, um, we, we only have about 10 bullets on the skill versus side because some people want to see you're, you're going to have nausea bullets they want to put pins everywhere. So we were like, okay, put it by region. And then they can contact you and say, okay, if they service uh, Florida, that's great. And then you can, like you, like you did, oh, we have locations everywhere in Florida. And that's what we tried to do. So like AWS, because we're not trying to say skill, the skill bridge site is the place of all information. Like Doc said, we want to make sure people know that PM to PM Best is a partner and go to their site for all of their wonderful opportunities they have available. We just want to let you know that we cleared that program and they're in good standing. And then you go ahead and find your wonderful opportunity for your future. And then let's work with your service to get you into that program successfully. That's that's the goal. So, you know, those three, three bullets there. All right. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, the, those pins are, are, are nice to quickly find what you're looking for, but I think uh, the search bar is probably a little better, right? <laughs> That's right. Put in search Florida or, you know, whatever industry you want to go. But maybe we'll, we'll, start, we'll, we'll start a task force for next time. Yeah, to that, you know, just because that program isn't necessarily at the location you want to be at, it may still be an opportunity to, to learn and then you can in the future move to the actual location you want to finish your Absolutely. life at. Um, okay. So we're running out of time, but real quick, uh, Derek, could you give us some highlights of your SkillBridge experience and uh, maybe some reasons why you're glad you did it? Oh yeah, I could do that. That's really easy. Um, uh, you know, I just wanted to, to share with Boris real quick. I think the biggest issue you face is command approval and command intelligence when it comes to it. Um, and I fought through that, that window of fog uh, to explain to people, hey, this is what it is. This is what I've got to get done. And this is the reasons why um, and remove that. So I think one of the greatest benefits I've had of, of the program, Jeremy, was that um, I got to go to IBM. Um, they selected me amongst all the candidates to do artificial intelligence. That was cool. Uh, so I got to spend time doing that. Um, they offered, I think I did 100 plus hours of training on a skill I didn't have. Um, and they offered it up front for free. Um, but also I did it through hiring our heroes and they offer 
uh, free training also that you get through something learn or no skill or um, do something learn as a partner, uh, which um, allows veterans to learn from uh, a set of skills that they may be interested in, whether it's PMP, whether it's AWS, whether it's Microsoft, whatever, it, it's, it's located on there. So that's offered free also. Uh, while I was there, I was recruited by Amazon Web Services and over a period of two months got through the interview process. But during that time frame, I had already taken um, some online classes that were free from Amazon, AWS Educate. Uh, which is free for transitioning service members within a year of the time. And I learned about cloud computing and was able to secure the position that way. Um, but I just, what was interesting is that in my pursuit of the skill bridge opportunity, but also taking, uh, and which later led to the position, is I started discovering there were lots of trainings available for veterans to take. And that was the most, I mean, well, veterans were service members to take prior to leaving the service and after leaving the service, like all went to opportunities, vets to PM, um, uh, the Microsoft SSA course for, for solutions architect, um, all those skill sets, all those courses, and there are tons of others that are available to service members that allow them to magnify their skill bridge experience. Um, I try to educate many, many, many service members on that. If you get a skill bridge assignment to go ahead and take the classes while you're going through that so that you leave with a certification or you just have the, the resident knowledge necessary to be competitive in your field, whatever field that may be, because you're not up against me, you're not up against your lane, you're not up against your fellow service member, you're up against a 16 year old who now industry may consider to be an asset coming down the road in technology, or maybe up against the guy who's been doing it for five or six years outside of his spectrum, or who's been a project manager within a civilian corporation for five to 10 years longer than you've been in the military doing the exact same position. People say, well, how is that possible? Five years as a project manager in the civilian world is a whole lot different than 20 years as a project manager strictly in a civilian in a military environment. The two don't always equate. And sometimes you have to be able to balance those out. So take the training, it's free. There's a lot of it out there. You just gotta ask the right questions. Don't take no for an answer. That's what's always kind of funny to me. Um, it's, it's amazing how many people always say, well, no, you can't do that because of this. Well, if you actually do the research and understand the regulation, you can and should understand what you're able to do. It's not just skill bridge, just the actual trainings that go along with that. And they need to maximize that. And if I can advise any senior leaders that your personnel have the right to do it, why not just maximize that? You get a smarter, better service member in the end and they can, they'll either stay or go. I had one guy, he was leaving and he was in his retirement window and he pulled back his retirement packet because they offered him a chance to go get further education and skills that he could do. So it worked for readiness for them, but long-term that person is gonna retire and they're gonna walk out a better qualified candidate. We have a military spouse. And that's another part of the program people don't understand. Military spouse is qualified for portions of it also. And if uh, she's now, she's a, she's a wife of a Navy 05. She had, went from marketing to software engineering. And we just got her into the impregnance program at our company. And she's going to go on and become a developer and a, and a solutions architect later. And I was very happy for her because that's an opportunity for them also. It really is a balance of understanding all the opportunities available for the service member and their families. And also the positive impact it has on the service that this is available for. Right, it is a very positive program. Uh, we're gonna close this up with uh, some advice. Uh, Eric, I'll start with you. What advice would you give to transitioning service members interested in SkillBridge? You know, so after working with over, uh, helping 4,000 veterans make eighty, ninety-five thousand dollars $95,000 a year over the last six years. I mean, that's what I do for a living, right? The one thing, uh, in fact, I even wrote a book on it. The one thing that I could tell every single veteran is, you have to get fluent in some in a in a civilian language. So we've all ran a shop, we've all ran teams. You have operational experience and you have specialized experience. You were a first shirt, you were a gunnery sergeant, you were a, a sergeant major, you were a department head, whatever. Get fluent. What that means is think about the last five years of your career, last ten years of your career. Write down what you liked. Write down what you hated. Go read job descriptions, not job titles, job descriptions. The job descriptions that have the I like stuff in it, look at the certificates, the certifications that go with that. Here's why. You're going to translate your military operational experience and specialized experience 
into the language of those credentials. They're industry recognized and get you a 20% on average salary bump too, right? Why not, right? Learn to talk like that, get the credential. Now your experience on that resume, on that LinkedIn profile is very provable. It's you're fluent in it and it's provable. And we build all of our programs at Vets to PM with one acid test in mind. Can I help an infantryman get a meaningful lucrative career in a civ div? Right? Because not even SWAT is a correlate to an infantryman. They don't kick in doors and snatch bad guys in SWAT. That's not part of their mission even. So that's our acid test. And when the veteran gets fluent, because look, the reality is combat commander's mission is to make combatant command and, and persecute the bad guy, right? What you do after you leave service, man, I got mission to prosecute. What you do when you leave service, I, you know, I, I want to help you, but I'm busy. You're busy too. Let's go. But it's a national security thing. You heard Derek. So it really is about the employer isn't going to take time to understand you. Combat commander's busy, right? Um, if they're even aware of the program, you've heard Charlene and Derek both say, hey, you, you got, awareness was the first hurdle. So it's really get, get fluent. Find out what kind of jobs have things you like in it. Match it up with a credential. Talk in that credential. Get that credential. Put that on your resume and your, uh, uh, your LinkedIn profile. And you're much farther down the road and better prepared for the Civ Div. Because at least now they can understand you. right? You're not talking DOD anymore. You're talking like the accountant talks or the HR professional talks or the you know, financial manager talks. So that's my piece of advice. Thanks, Derek. Charlene, what piece of advice would you give to transitioning service members interested in um, Well, in my experience, that last year was there was a lot going on. I mean, you're working with the VA, you're doing your retirement, you're closing out things that you have with your department or whatever you're working in. There's a lot of transitioning things happening in that last year that you don't anticipate. You don't anticipate this barrage of to-do lists by multiple entities and you having to prioritize your time among all those things. And so I, I would really emphasize valuing your time and valuing um, learning about yourself. As, as um, Doc Wright mentioned, you know, if you understand what you do and don't like, that's like your step one. But, uh, you know, it could go so far as do you want to work in an office? Do you want to work outside? And, and knowing and learning more about yourself, because me, I was in 20 years and I joined when I was 17. So there's not a lot of learning about myself that's not Army related. <laughs> so I, that last year, I really had to put a lot of emphasis on what is that I want to do and what I want to do from now on. So um, I just recommend that people take that time to really get to know themselves. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Charlene. And Derek, what piece of advice would you give? Uh, you mentioned quite a few things earlier, but what's the biggest piece of advice you give a service member interested in Skillbridge? I think Charlene hit it right on the head. You got to have a plan. You got to have a uh, not a short, even I, I tell people you don't have to have a short term plan. You gotta have a five year plan. Um, know what you want to do, and then we'll know what you uh, know where you want to be, and then know what you need to do to get there, and then put those in place. Put it on. You gotta put it to paper. You, if you don't put it to paper, it is easy to get lost in the minutia of trying to transition out of the service, plus qualify for this program, plus get get your family ready, plus plus plus. It, it doesn't stop. So I would say that that aspect there, you definitely have to plan. But also um, seek out, know what field you want to go into and whatever the requirements necessary to get to that field. Take the additional training you need to take. You know, there are military officer certification programs too before you leave. And you need to dive into those and see if those match what your field's going to be. Um, they're, just, just be ready for the transition. It's not, it doesn't happen. Just saying I'll, I'll deal with it or I'll, I'll make it work later isn't a plan. Trust me, these days, that's not the case. Um, it just, just, it just isn't. You're always in competition with somebody else, but the better prepared you are, the more competitive you are, the easier your life will be. That's my advice. Yeah, you should always have a plan in anything you're doing, but uh, in this, it's key to getting approved and finding the right opportunities. Uh, Boris, uh, what advice would you give any service members uh, who are transitioning to Skillbridge? Thank, thanks, Jeremy, for the opportunity. Uh, I think I think the, the wonderful part about this panel at large is 
we're all veterans, right? So we've all transitioned in some capacity. Uh, everybody's been spot on, so I'm trying not to repeat. The biggest thing is, yeah, you gotta have a plan. I mean, uh, if if you're gonna if you're watching this or listening to us speak, and I wasn't enlisted. People here were prior enlisted officers. It doesn't matter if you're an E or an O or a W. Um, you gotta have a plan, and and uh, time things are not always gonna go to plan. So be adaptive, and that's important. But if you if you're trying to skill bridge, you you gotta make sure you build in that time. And you gotta sometimes educate your leadership. It's been talked about here as well. So part of that is on you. So it's nothing's gonna be given to you. Nothing was given to me or any of us here, and or any of your shipmates, if you will, right? Or, or fellow brothers or sisters. So in that particular case, help yourself, but more importantly, pass it on. Uh, so pass it on to your leaders. Pass it on to your mentors, and be a mentor. Um, so here we're all talking here and. Part, part of the eternal code, if you will, is to make sure we help each other. I think the biggest success of Skillbridge is we all want to help each other, right? So what's made Skillbridge successful is the fact that we're all willing to come back into the space and make sure the next individual and next generations are thriving within because of this program. So when somebody asks me what's made Skillbridge successful, it's not me. It's Jeremy. It's Derek. It's Charlene, it's Eric. So, you know, help help yourself first and help your family. As mentioned, spouses have an opportunity too. There's many organizations that are willing to contribute and help and there's military spouse programs. Um, we'll work with the employers of Skillbridge as well. So that, that's, a, that's a huge piece as well because we wanna make sure your family is successful, when, especially when you're transitioning or even if you're not transitioning yet. Um, you might not want to transition, so as Derek mentioned, uh, and you don't know when you're going to transition. Mine was abrupt. I did not get to retire, and some of us here did not get to retire, and that's that's an important piece to know. And you might always plan to serve four or five years. That was my initial goal. So I had a plan for I had a five-year plan actually, Derek, as you mentioned, and my five-year plan did not go that way. And I got to luckily I was blessed, and I got to serve a little longer. Um, but you know just have a plan and be able to change it but give back pass it on so thank you thank you board all right so um if if you want to find out more about Skillbridge, uh, it for vets to pm uh, doc your website is vets to pm.com correct correct is, is there any other way you would like somebody to contact you if, if they want more information well, I mean, I think, you know, if if you've got folks watching this or listening to this and they haven't figured it out yet, I mean, you have a team of pipe hitters that have been there, done it, got the T-shirt with holes in it and battle scars to prove it. Right. So, you know, I'm in, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, Doc Wright 2012 is the handle. Connect with me. I'm sure Charlene, Derek and Boris will tell you the same thing. Boris has mentored me for years. Um, I saw Derek's uh, Derek's uh, uh, webinar with you guys a couple months ago. I was blown away, Derek, and you crushed it, sir. Uh, so, you know, connect with folks who have been down the path, right? We can tell you where the left and the right boundaries are. Hey, that's a that's steep. That, that slope's too steep. Stay off of it. This way's flatter. Like, connect with us. Ask us questions. And that's one thing vets don't do very well. We don't ask for help. We don't ask questions. We'll figure it out. I mean, in general, right? So if that's not you, don't worry about it. I didn't mean the broad brush paint you, but ask for help before you realize you're going under for the last time, right? We're here to help you, right? So anyway, connect with All us. Right. Great. Uh, Charlene, do you do you have a way for somebody to add you on LinkedIn or, or yeah. something if they want advice on transitioning? Sure, it's Charlene LaMountain, L.A. Mountain, one word. So that's me on LinkedIn. So, and I'm on Facebook, too. That's easier for people. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Derek, I know you mentor quite a few people uh, for SkillBridge. How would we get a hold of you? Same thing. As, uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. If you need to, it's Derek Fishback. It's, uh, it's out there. Um, you see my header for Amazon Web Services. That's all. It'll be there. But yeah, that's just don't be afraid. Don't pause. Got a question? Just 
just put it out there. That's both for employers and or uh, service members to to query. Anybody can just query me, and I try to get you the best resource possible. Thank you, Derek. And sure. Boris, what's the website if I want to go to the official SkillBridge uh, website and learn about either how to apply or what locations are available, or if I'm an industry partner and I want to be an employer for SkillBridge? Like everything else in, in government, we make it hard. I'm kidding. It's a dotskillbridge.usalearning.gov. But the easiest thing probably to do is, Sharon, you mentioned and Doc and Derek, is just Google DOD Skillbridge. And it probably should be the first thing up there. Um, but if you don't see a .gov at the end or .mil, remember, it's not official government site. So uh, you, you're not going to the right place. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's our site. And then I'm also available on LinkedIn. Uh, my Picture there is a lot younger and prettier than I am now. So uh, before before the battle wounds that Doc said I got. So there we go. Thank you. And of course, we're always here to help uh, veteransflorida.org. We help with uh, skill bridge matching as well as we uh, assist employers in uh, applying for a skill bridge program of their own. Thank you for being here today.